Okay, here you are at the beginning of the exam and you need to make some choices. The first thing you read is that the time you get is one hour and 45 minutes. Now, really annoyingly, that gives you 45 minutes to do the writing question, which carries 40 marks, which is the same as the one hour you spend on the reading marks. Now, you should definitely do what worked for you in the mocks, but I know I train my students to do the writing first because they've got much more energy then. They're going to use that time much better. They're going to get higher marks doing it that way around. But as I say, stick to what you've done that's worked. If it didn't work in the mocks, do it my way. You are advised to spend about 15 minutes reading through the sources and all five questions you have to answer. This is absolutely stupid advice for several reasons. I'm not going to try and persuade you that I'm right. I'm just going to show you me answering the question, never having read the paper before, not knowing what's coming up, without reading stuff in advance, so you can see how it works. If you like it, do it my way. If you don't like it, read the paper first. It's your exam. All I need to do is read what the source is about. So source A is going to be an extract from Touching the Void in which experienced climber Joe Simpson describes how he and fellow climber Simon Yates scaled a 21,000 foot mountain in Peru. On the way down, Joe fell and broke his leg. In this extract, Joe explains how, because of his broken leg, Simon had to lower him down the mountain using the rope. Well, that's so helpful. I now know that when I read this extract, I'm going to understand all of it. Source B. In 1899, British explorer Gertrude Bell set out to climb one of the most dangerous mountains in the Alps, the Meiji. I don't know how to pronounce that. Source B is an extract from the letter she sent home describing the climb. So I've already worked out they're both about climbing. They both survive the climbing. I know that Joe Simpson had broken his leg. And so when I'm reading this one, I'm going to see if she gets injured or not. That's all I have to read in advance. Now, when I get to the questions, question one is, read again the first part of source A from lines one to four. I can go straight into that question because I only have to read four lines. That seems to me a good deal, so I'm going to answer question one first. The coal was exposed and windy. Well, the first thing is I don't know what this means, but I'm not going to panic. I know they're on a mountain, so this must be part of a mountain. Directly beneath us, the glacier we had walked up five days ago curved away towards the crevasses which led to base camp. Now, I might not know what crevasses are, but I do know there'll be other parts of the mountain, which led to base camp. I know that that's probably where they were camping. Nearly 3,000 feet below us. Okay, so they're 3,000 feet above the base camp. It would take many long lowerings. What was a lowering? Well, if I go back up here, I know that Simon had to lower Joe down the mountain using a rope. So I know what the lowering is. But it was all downhill. And we had lost the sense of hopelessness that had invaded us at the ice cliff. So I know they're going downhill, so up above there must have been an ice cliff. OK, I get what's going on. Time to answer the question. The climbers were sheltering from the wind. Well, I remember it being windy, but I don't remember anything about the shelter. Let's double check. No, they're definitely getting lowered down the mountain. There's no hint that they're stopping to stay out of the wind, so I know that's rubbish. The glacier was higher up the mountain. No, I've got a really good memory about that one. Directly beneath us, the glacier we had walked up five hours ago. So we know that they were now above the glacier because they'd walked up it ages ago and they're now going down. And it's directly beneath them. They had been on the mountain for at least five days. I've got no memory of anything that sounds like that because it's an exam and I'm panicking, but they'd walked up it five days ago, and so they must have been on the mountain at least five days ago. So C is true. Base camp was more than 3,000 feet below them. Yep, I think that's right, but I'm not just gonna put my first answer down, I'll go and double check. So base camp was nearly 3,000 feet below. 
and this says base camp was more than 3,000 feet below. Aha! So more than is there to catch me out, so that is false. Joe thought they would make it back to base camp quickly. That sounds like rubbish. Let's go and double check. It would take many long lowerings, so that's the opposite of quickly. That must be false. There were no more uphill sections to climb. Well, that sounds right because my memory is they're coming down the mountain. It was all downhill. Yep, there's nothing else going uphill. That is correct. The climbers were feeling more positive now than they were before. Yes, we had lost the sense of hopelessness that had invaded us. That's all in the past tense. So that must be what was going on before. So that is true. On the cliff ice, the climbers had felt overwhelmed by despair. Well, they certainly had felt miserable. Let's go back and see what it said. Hopelessness. So does hopelessness mean despair? Yes, it does. That's going to be true. So because I only had to read the beginning of the source, I've answered question one first. But what if it wasn't the beginning of the source? What would I do if I had to read halfway through the source. So what if the question was about these lines here? In those circumstances, I wouldn't do question one first because it would take me ages to answer the question because I'd have to read all this first to make sure I understood what was happening here. So tactically, what I'm going to do there is answer question three first because question three always says this. You only need to refer to source A. That's always true. And then it gives you a section of lines. So every year this is the same. So for question three, I do need to read the whole of source A so that those particular lines will make sense. But because it's worth 12 marks, it's worth actually reading the whole. And then when I get to question one, it doesn't matter where the lines have come from because I've read the whole source. Already in question three, I can answer question one super quickly, just like I could in this example, because they happen to be the first four lines. OK, because question three is worth 12 marks, I know that means I have one and a half minutes per mark, because I'm not spending ages reading the paper. I'm just going straight in. So that means I've got 18 minutes to read the extract and write. And so I'll write up here my end time for this, so I know what time I have to stop writing my answer and move on to the next question. For most students, you will probably need to read the whole of the source up to those lines so that you make sure you understand what's going on when we get there. So let's read that extract now. If you don't want to hear me read it, jump ahead. What time is it? Simon asked. Just gone four. We don't have much time, do we? I could see him weighing up the possibilities. I wanted to carry on down, but it was Simon's decision. I waited for him to make up his mind. I think we should keep going, he said at last. Simon let me slide faster than I had expected, and despite my cries of alarm and pain, he had kept the pace of descent going. I stopped shouting to him after 50 feet. The rising wind and continuous avalanches drowned out all communications. Instead, I concentrated on keeping my leg clear of the snow. It was an impossible task. Despite lying on my good leg, the right boot snagged in the snow as the weight of my body pushed down. Each abrupt jerk caused searing pain in my knee. I sobbed and grasped and swore at the snow and the cold and most of all at Simon. At the changeover point, I hopped onto my left leg, trying to think the pain away. It ebbed slowly, leaving a dreadful throbbing ache and a leaden tiredness. So I'm not sure what a changeover point is, but I imagine if Simon is having to lower Joe, then at some points Joe must be having to lower Simon. OK, I'm coming up to lines 23 to 31, and I'm going to start writing my answer as soon as I get there. I'm not going to wait till I've finished reading all of lines 23 to 31. And what will I be answering? How does the writer use language? Well, that's always the same, so I knew that going into the exam, which basically just means quote and say what the method is. So I know to do that already. To describe how he feels, which he is it? Well, we know he's always writing about Simon, so the writer must be Joe. OK, and this is the section I'm going to start writing about. Let's find out. The tugs came again far too soon, and carelessly I slumped against the rope and let myself go. 
So he's obviously being lowered again here. The drop went on until I could bear it no longer. So he must still be in pain. Yet there was nothing that I could do to bring the agony to an end. All right, he's in loads of pain. Howling and screaming for Simon to stop achieved nothing. The blame had to lie somewhere. So I swore Simon's character to the devil. Okay, so he's blaming Simon. And I've got a pretty good idea of what he's feeling as we get to the lines to answer the question. The terrible sliding stopped and I hung silently against the slope. Three faint tugs trembled the taut rope and I hopped onto my leg. I know that there are five things that are always going to be in this question. Those five are metaphor, simile, personification, sibilance, alliteration. I know that most of these come up every single year and I've spotted some sibilance. The terrible sliding stopped silently slope. Now, sibilance is only ever used to create two atmospheres. One is a feeling of peace and the other is sinister threat. I could go for either of those in this circumstance. He might be feeling peaceful because the pain has temporarily stopped as he's no longer being lowered. Or it could be sinister because he's worried about what's going to happen to his leg and whether they're going to get to the bottom. So let's see which one of those I go for. Three faint tugs trembled the taut rope and I hopped onto my leg. That could be peaceful. A wave of nausea and pain swept over me. Oh, we're going for sinister. I was glad of the freezing blasts of snow biting into my face. So obviously he wants to feel pain in his face instead of his leg. So we're going with sinister instead of peace. Perfect. Yates feels terrible pain and fear which is why he describes the sliding as terrible. Next, he uses sibilance to emphasise both his relief that the pain has temporarily stopped because the sliding has stopped, but also to emphasise his sense of fear about the sinister implications of his injury, not just the long-term damage to his knee, but the possibility that the descent will end in further tragedy on the slope. Okay, because I'm looking for those five features, a wave of nausea. Well, nausea and pain aren't literally a wave, so that's a metaphor. I was glad of the freezing blasts of snow biting into my face. Biting again is a metaphor. Okay, well, it's easy to write about these two metaphors. What are they there to do? They're going to dramatise something. This one dramatises the pain. And this one also dramatises the pain because it shows how much he enjoys the pain in his face as a distraction against the pain in his leg because his leg's broken. Here the pain swept over him as though he was going to be overwhelmed. But here the metaphor biting into my face is hugely painful but it's not eating his whole face, it's just into it so it's contained and this kind of implies he'll be able to survive the pain. Okay, let's write. He uses metaphor to dramatise the extent of the extreme pain he's suffering. Nausea overcomes him like a wave which then swept over him as though he could not resist it However, he next describes the snow as painfully biting into my face. This metaphor suggests that he's actually grateful for an alternative source of pain to take his mind off the agony in his leg. Rather than overwhelming him, this pain is localised into my face, which gives him the confidence that this is a pain he will be able to endure. We also get the sense that he's happy to have something to distract him, no matter how painful. Okay, let's go back to the extract. My head cleared as I waited for the burning to subside from my knee. Well, that's nice, but there isn't an obvious technique in it, so I'm going to ignore it. Several times I had felt it twist sideways when my boot snagged. Okay, well, we've got sibilance again. He's talking about his knee, so this is sinister. It suggests that his knee is very damaged. There would be a flare of agony as the knee kinked back and parts within the joint seemed to shear past each other with a sickening, grisly crunch. Right, well, I have the metaphor of agony being a flare and I have more sibilance with seamed and sheer and past and sickening. 
and grisly. So I can now describe not just the agony, but his feelings about the implications of that agony, what it means about the damage to the knee. And I'm going to focus on these two words, sickening and grisly crunch. So this is a pair of adjectives. Having two together shows there's a pattern in his writing, so I'm going to write about that too. The next metaphor describes his pain as a flare of agony. A flare is used as a warning, comma, or a cry for help. And we can infer that Yates feels desperate for assistance and also desperate that he worries the pain is too great to survive his ordeal on the mountain. He also returns to sibilance as a way to dramatise his worry at the sinister turn of events when he concentrates on the damage inside his knee. His joint seemed to shear, which both suggests that the damage is long-term, but also that he will be reduced to only using one leg in this dangerous descent of the mountain, which might lead to further tragedy. He uses a pair of adjectives to describe his anxiety at the crunch in his knee, which is both sickening and grisly. Okay, I remind myself where I have to stop, so I'm only going to line 31. I had barely ceased sobbing before my boot snagged again. Well, even more sibilance. The fact that he's sobbing suggests that he's completely overcome with pain. And by saying he'd barely stopped before it snagged again implies that he's also worried that the pain is going to overwhelm him because his feet are going to keep snagging. At the end, my leg shook uncontrollably. So perhaps we can argue that he's feeling as though he's losing control. I tried to stop it shaking, but the harder I tried, the more it shook. So that backs up the idea that he is losing control. And he's worried about that, which is why he writes, I tried to stop it shaking. Okay, well, the other thing, of course, is I haven't mentioned any alliteration yet, and I have barely sobbing before boot. What's that emphasising? It's emphasising these repeated stabs of pain each time his boot gets snagged. Okay, because that's a new method, I'm going to impress the examiner by starting there. Next, he uses the alliteration of barely, comma, sobbing, before, and boot to emphasise the beats of pain he's getting every time his boot gets snagged. This implies that he's feeling overwhelmed with the pain and doesn't feel he will be able to escape it or manage it. Even when this is over, at the end, he focuses on the effect on his leg, which shook uncontrollably. This adverb implies that he is fighting for control, but unable to establish it. He emphasises this by returning to the idea in the next sentence, with a contrast. But the harder I tried, the more it shook. This conveys his sense of helplessness that he is not going to be able to control either his own emotions or his pain or indeed how his body reacts. This creates a sense of helplessness. Okay, I know that the examiner wants me to quote from this line because it's the last one in the sequence and they wouldn't have stopped here unless there was something in it. I pressed my face into the snow. It's still sibilance, nothing new. Gritted my teeth and waited. Okay, I've got a sentence in three parts, but I can't really think of anything to say about that. At last it eased. Okay, now he's finished this really long paragraph with a short sentence. What is he trying to emphasise here? That he's getting control back. So this introduces a sense of hope, which contrasts with the helplessness we had before. I'll go with that. And I can link that to these actions where he's gritting his teeth and he's waiting, so he's taking control of his body again. However, the paragraph ends with him trying to take control of his body, where he gritted his teeth and then waited. This determination appears to work. Consequently, he ends the paragraph with a four-word sentence. This dramatic conclusion 
emphasises his newfound control as the pain eased. This allows us to imagine his feeling of hope in contrast to the earlier feelings of helplessness. This makes sense given the fact that we know he eventually survives as he is writing this account. Having done question three first, I now have a natural advantage coming into question four. I've already read the whole of source A, so I have a really good idea about half of this question already. Let's see what the question asks. Compare how the writers convey their different feelings and perspectives on their adventures in the mountains. I'll highlight that on my paper so I remember not to forget it in my answer. And feelings and perspectives are really the same thing. I'll just remember to use those words when I'm writing. Now, I only have 16 marks, which, including my reading time, only gives me 24 minutes. In those 24 minutes, I may not be able to write fully about both texts. Obviously, I'm a teacher, I can, but you might not be able to, but you still want top marks. So, tactically, how do you show that you're going to write about both texts fully? Well, it's easy. You make a point about the beginning of the text, and then you make a point about the end of the text. The other advantage of that is that the feelings and perspectives will always have changed by the end of the text. So knowing that, I can already show really good skill by showing how that point of view has changed. Let's dive into source A and see what I mean. Okay, the first feeling I'm going to focus on is that we had lost the sense of hopelessness that had invaded us at the ice cliff. So at the beginning of the text, Simpson feels a lack of despair, which is not quite yet optimism. However, he's also patient because he's waiting for Simon to make up his mind. Okay, now let's go to the end of the text. He was still grinning and his confidence was infectious. Who said one man can't rescue another, I thought. So now the optimism has increased. We had changed from climbing to rescue and the partnership had worked just as effectively. We hadn't dwelt on the accident. There had been an element of uncertainty at first, but as soon as we had started to act positively, everything had come together. So he's feeling positive and he's also reflecting that their partnership is likely to be successful. Everything had come together. Okay, ready when you are, I said, lying down on my side again. Slow down a bit this time, you'll have my leg off otherwise. So that's a change, isn't it? Before he was waiting for Simon, Simon was the one who was in charge. Here, Joe Simpson is the one giving the instructions. He now feels more in charge himself. But it doesn't end there. He didn't seem to hear me, for I went down at an even faster pace than before, and the hammering torture began again with a vengeance. My optimism evaporated. So we've suddenly got this huge turning point where all that increased confidence has suddenly disappeared. It's been replaced by pain, which is described as hammering torture, and his optimism has completely gone. It's evaporated. He no longer fears in control. So that's a hell of a lot to write about, isn't it? Let's do it. Despite his broken leg, Simpson initially feels optimistic, explaining that we had lost the sense of hopelessness that had invaded us at the ice cliff. This metaphor, using military language, shows that he sees his situation as a battle which he can win. Simpson includes speech to let us feel his sense of worry. We don't have much time, do we? This implies that his optimism may be temporary and depends on quick action. Nevertheless, he doesn't feel in charge, which we discover from the contrast, I wanted to carry on down, but it was Simon's decision. By the end of the text, Simpson's perspective has changed. He conveys a sense of pride when he congratulates himself. We hadn't dwelt on the accident. Again, he employs contrast, noticing that there had been an element of uncertainty at first, but as soon as we had started to act positively, everything had come together. The effect of this positivity is emphasised by following it with the word everything. 
conveying his belief that positivity is the solution that will deliver both climbers from possible tragedy. Simpson also feels much more in control as he begins to give orders. Slow down a bit this time. However, this is juxtaposed by the complete loss of positivity in the final short three-word sentence. My optimism evaporated. This sudden change has been caused by extreme pain, which he describes as hammering torture. This emotive language helps us understand that he must have wondered whether he could survive the pain as well as the dangerous descent. Let's tidy that up and explore how I've dealt with the methods. How did I write about the different feelings and perspectives? I've highlighted those in yellow so you can see I'm doing it all the time. Feels optimistic, feels a sense of worry, his optimism may be temporary, he doesn't feel in charge, now his perspective has changed, he has a sense of pride, he's conveying his belief that positivity is the solution. Simon feels much more in control, he feels extreme pain, and then finally he must have wondered whether he would survive the pain as well as the dangerous descent. So that's at least eight different changes of feeling, I haven't counted them, but there's a huge amount. Now we come to the very tricky question of how, and most teachers say, well, this is a method because that's what the MART scheme says, and teachers are trained to think, well, methods must be literary techniques like simile, metaphor, literation, personification, blah, blah, blah. But actually, let's use some common sense here. How means any way you can think of that the writer is conveying this. And I've shown you that in green. So he uses a metaphor, which also incorporates military language. Here, he uses speech to do it. Here, he uses contrast. Here, he puts emphasis by the proximity of the word everything to positively. They're next door to each other. Here, he shows that he's giving orders. Here, he's juxtaposing something. Here, he's using a final short three-word sentence for emphasis. Here, he's giving us a sudden change from what's gone before, which again is that juxtaposition. Here, he's using emotive language. In other words, the examiner doesn't have a checklist of methods that you must tick off. Teachers think in a checklist like this because they think it's easier for their students to have a checklist in mind. Now, if that is you, then yes, you can use a checklist. It looks like this. So I can remember this mnemonic, Vaxi, and I know that whatever I pick on, I'm going to be able to comment on the choice of verbs, the alliteration or that other manipulation of sound sibilance, contrast, which also includes juxtaposition, simile, which is a form of comparison, so that's the same as metaphor and personification, I group those together, and I know there will always be emotive language. And I have 100% confidence that whatever quotation I'm looking at, it will include at least one of these methods. So imagine we leap into the middle of the text and see the terrible sliding stopped. I've got sibilance here. I've got emotive language with terrible. I hung silently against the slope. The sibilance again in slope and silently, and I have this interesting verb, hung, which also reminds us of death. It's got a connotation of fatality. Three faint tugs trembled. I now have alliteration, and the consonants of the T in faint doubles up with the taut rope. So for each of these, I just have to say how that gives us the writer's feelings or perspectives. A wave of nausea. Well, we talked about that metaphor in question three. And pain swept over me. Oh, look, a verb choice that shows that he's going to be overwhelmed. I was glad of the freezing blasts. This unexpected juxtaposition shows there must be something wrong for him to enjoy this freezing cold as pain. Blasts and biting is alliteration, which gives us this shock that he's feeling in the pain of the cold. My head cleared as I waited for the burning to subside from my knee. We have burning being used as a metaphor here to try and convey the pain inside his knee joint. Several times I had felt it twist sideways when my boot snagged. Oh, I've got the sibilance again. 
of snagged and sideways and twist and several and times this is sinister it conveys his worry about the pain that he's feeling and the injury that he therefore must have and so on every single sentence will be packed with those techniques so you really don't have to go looking for them instead what you look for is the stuff that answers the question what is conveying the writer's feelings what is conveying the writer's perspective and point of view i'll quote that and once i've looked at that quotation i will instantly know which part of vars that is because vars covers a hundred percent of quotations and as i've just demonstrated in each sentence there will be more than one of these for you to write about should you choose well the technique for source b is exactly the same i've got to work out what their feelings and perspectives are and it's about the adventures in the mountains this box will always help me get my bearings in 1899 british explorer gertrude bell set out to climb one of the most dangerous mountains in the alps the meiji i'm guessing source b is an extract from the letter she sent home describing the climb Monday, 28th of August, 1899. I thought you would gather from my last letter that I meant to have a shot at climbing the Meiji and would be glad to hear that I had descended safely. Well, I'll tell you, it's awful. I think if I had known exactly what was before me, I should not have faced it. But fortunately, I did not, and I look back on it with complete satisfaction, and I look forward to other things with no further apprehension. So now we just simply compare. She seems to have similar feelings of optimism and fear as Simpson had, but the difference is that she doesn't have any sense of pain. Whereas Simpson was trying to show the optimism was based on his teamwork with his partner Simon, her optimism seems to be that nothing went wrong, which is why she looks on it with complete satisfaction. So when I look at the beginning, I'm contrasting that, comparing it to the beginning of Source A. I left here on Friday having hired a local guide, Marius, and we walked up to the refuge. I went out to watch the beautiful red sunlight fading from the snow and rocks. The Meiji looked dreadfully forbidding in the dusk. When I came in, I found that Marius had kindly put my rug in a corner of the floor, and what with the straw and my cloak for a pillow, I made myself very comfortable. So there's an air of understatement here, isn't there? We would expect straw and a cloak to be a very uncomfortable bed. But the contrast is she's putting up with small hardships compared to the pain of Simpson's broken leg and, of course, the fear of dying on the mountain. The night lasted from 8 till 12, but I didn't sleep at all. We got up after 12 and I went down to the river and washed a little. It was a perfect night, clear stars and the moon not yet over the hills. We left just as the moon shone into the valley. Marius always went ahead and carried a lantern till we got onto the snow when it was light enough with only the moon. So here we can see she's feeling romantic, she's transfixed by the beauty of her environment, which obviously is a complete contrast to the environment that Simpson describes. In fact, he doesn't have any attachment to the place at all, does he? At 1.30 we reached the glacier and put on our ropes. Aha! There was a glacier in the previous one, wasn't there? It wasn't really cold, though there was an icy little breath of wind, or well, we can easily contrast that to the freezing blasts which he welcomed. And here we have a similarity, both writers are quite happy to be met by extreme cold. We could interpret this line as understatement, for example. We had about three hours up very nice rock. I had been in high spirits for it was so easy, but before long my hopes were dashed. We had about two hours and a half of awfully difficult rock. There were two places where Marius literally pulled me up like a parcel. He has the strength of a bear, and it was absolutely sheer down. The first half hour, I gave myself up for lost. It didn't seem possible that I could get up all that way without ever making a slip. You see, I had practically never been on a rock before. However, I didn't let on to Marius and presently began to seem quite natural to be hanging by my eyelids over an abyss. Dun, dun, dun. So we have a similar situation where one climber is pulling another climber on a rope. They're both 
dangling over a precipice, an abyss here. But this writer puts aside her fear and replaces it with excitement, perhaps even a romantic attachment to Marius with the strength of a bear, which we can contrast to Simpson and his friend Simon, who are relying on each other's professionalism to get down as quickly as possible without further damage. We can zoom in on the simile like a parcel, which shows how she's going to be safely delivered, which is a complete contrast to the lack of safety Simpson feels. We stayed on the summit until 11. It was gorgeous, quite cloudless. I went to sleep for half an hour. It's a very long way up, but it's a longer way down, unless you take the way Marius's axe took, the cord by which it was carefully tied to his wrist broke, and it disappeared forever into space. So this is interesting, her fear now is not for herself, but for her fellow climber. Here comes the worst place on the whole mage. Marius vanished, carrying a very long rope, and I waited. Presently, I felt a little tug on the rope. Mademoiselle! Oh no, that's wrong. Mademoiselle, called Marius calmly, and obediently off I went. There were two little humps to hold on to, on an overhanging rock, and there was me in mid-air, and Marius round the corner, steadfastly holding the rope tight. Perfectly fearful. I thought at the time how very well I was climbing, and how odd it was that I should not be afraid. So here we have this feeling of optimism that she's going to survive no matter what. There's a sense of pride in her own ability, which we can contrast to Simpson's pride in their teamwork. And her lack of fear can be contrasted, of course, to his evaporated optimism. The worst was over then, and the most tedious part was to come. There was no difficulty but there was also no moment when you had not to pay the strictest attention. There was an hour of ice and rock, till at last Marius and I found ourselves, with thankfulness, back on the glacier. So the endings are obviously completely different. She finishes with complete optimism that they are entirely safe, and that is a total contrast to Simpson's feeling of despair as he gets lowered dangerously at the end of Source A. Of course, there's absolutely no way that I'm going to be able to write about all of that, but I've taken the time to show you that every paragraph will be jam-packed with emotions and perspectives, which will be easy to compare and contrast to the emotions and perspectives in Source A. Tactically, I'm just going to pick something from the beginning, something from the middle, and something from the end. In contrast to Simpson, Belle begins with utter confidence that she has made the right decision in climbing a dangerous mountain. She conveys this with contrast, a method which Simpson favours, juxtaposing her complete satisfaction after the experience with her description of it at the time. It's awful. Unlike Simpson, she focuses on her feelings of wonder and excitement at the beauty of nature, conveyed in the alliteration of went out to watch the beautiful red sunlight. This sense of wonder is also emphasised through the sibilance of sunlight and snow. This romantic attachment to the setting is married to a romantic description of her climbing partner Marius. She feels completely safe in his hands, conveyed by the simile Marius literally pulled me up like a parcel, which we can imagine being safely delivered. This is the opposite to Simpson, who has to warn Simon to lower him slowly because of the dangers posed by the mountain. Another contrast is Simpson's pleasure at the professionalism he and Simon exhibit, whereas Bell rejoices in an amateur status with the confession, you see, I had practically never been on a rock before. She uses this contrast to help explain why she doesn't feel any fear when she describes herself hanging by my eyelids over an abyss. She wants her readers to understand her excitement at the strangeness of this experience, which is why she over-exaggerates hanging on by her eyelids instead of her fingertips. This suggests that her dangers were not real, unlike 
the potentially fatal danger facing Simpson and Simon. Her mountain adventure does turn very dangerous when Marius's axe is lost. This causes Marius to leave her behind and set up a different system of ropes, from which we can infer Belle was vulnerable to a fall from the cliff face. Again, she focuses on her amateur innocence to remark, in hindsight, how odd it was that I should not be afraid. This understatement reveals that this moment on the mountain could have ended with injury or death and that she was very lucky to survive it unscathed. This is the complete opposite of Simpson's sense of dread when his optimism evaporated and the hammering torture of his knee overcame his senses. Let's have a quick overview of my approach here. In this light green or blue, I'm colorblind, I'm afraid, you can see where I'm going back to source A and making a comparison or a distinction. So in contrast to Simpson, unlike Simpson, this is the opposite to Simpson. Another contrast is, whereas Bell, unlike the potentially fatal danger, this is the complete opposite. I focused on that because you can see that comparing ideas and perspectives in a perceptive way is right at the very top of the mark scheme. In green, as before, I have the author's methods. We have contrast, juxtaposing, alliteration, sibilance, a romantic description, the simile, a confession, contrast, over-exaggeration. I didn't put hyperbole as a piece of vocabulary in there with you in case you weren't familiar with it. Focusing on amateur innocence, which again was that kind of bonus knowledge I didn't expect you to have, and the idea of understatement. Let's look at the examiner's answer. The writer in Source A is tortured by alternating hope and despair, as the reader is led on a roller coaster journey, sharing the highs and lows of his emotions. So you can see the examiner favours a kind of summary statement at the beginning of the writing. Now, I don't think you need that. I've obviously covered the same idea within the body of my writing. But a legitimate technique is to start your writing here on this line, and then when you've got to the end of what you're saying about both of the sources, you can then fill in a summary sentence at the beginning. You'd write that last because it's much easier to summarise the text once you've written about it. However, as the examiner says, this is not a model answer and therefore you don't have to include that summary. Now, this colour yellow introduces us to the methods. The writer opens with a glimpse of hope, so how the writer begins is a method. A final devastating short sentence is a method. Leaving the reader on a cliffhanger, another method. So you can see, methods aren't necessarily literary techniques. Another key thing to take away from my answer is that you don't have to write in the kind of detail I've done. Remember, my advice is just to keep writing for your whole time limit. However, if you make sure you focus on the beginning and the end of each text, you'll definitely be able to show the examiner that you're answering the whole of the question with the whole of each source. So question two now is going to be much easier because we've read both of the texts, we know them in lots of detail. There are only eight marks for this question and we're not going to compare Simon and Marius fully, we're just going to focus on the differences between them. So at the beginning, Simon is in charge, but then so is Marius, so that won't go into our answer. Simon let me slide faster than I had expected, and despite my cries of alarm and pain, he had kept the pace of descent going. So again, this is a similarity, we ignore it. Simon's mood is cheerful, which we can contrast to Marius, who we can describe as calm, but then he becomes perfectly fearful, so he's afraid. Simon instead is purposeful, nothing to wait for, come on. And we discover he was still grinning, so he's very happy, and his confidence was infectious. So that is an opposite to Marius, who looked alarmed. The other difference, of course, is that Marius is dealing with an amateur climber, and Simon is dealing with an expert, which of course would give him greater confidence, even though that expert has a broken leg. 
The other difference here is that Simon is acting in partnership with Simpson, whereas Marius is very much the senior partner, the man in charge, of Bell. Although both Marius and Simon are engaged in similar activities, lowering their charges down a mountain, their character and mood is very different. When Bell gets into difficulties, Marius is described as calling out to her calmly. However, this emotion quickly turns into fear, which Bell describes as perfectly fearful, implying that this fear appeared overwhelming to her. In contrast, Simon is able to ignore the danger that Simpson is in, and indeed his pain. This helps him act urgently, telling Simpson that there's nothing to wait for, come on. However, this urgency is not coupled with fear, because unlike Marius, he is filled with confidence, and that confidence is inspirational, infectious, communicated by a grin. Simpson focuses on Simon's skill as a mountaineer and their effective partnership. Bell, on the other hand, comments on Marius's lack of skill, for example, where he loses his axe, and instead fixates on his bear-like strength. This also hints at a powerful physical attraction, whereas we receive no physical description of Simon. A final difference is that Marius appears to take great care of Belle, lowering her like a parcel, whereas Simon completely ignores Simpson's request to lower him more slowly. He appears quite willing to torture Simpson with pain in order to lower him quickly enough to save his life. In yellow, I'd like you to notice that my quotations come thick and fast. They aren't there for me to analyse. They're just there for me to show a difference. This question is a point scoring exercise. The more points I make, the higher marks I get. It's easy for the examiner to count my differences because I'm introducing them with these phrases and connectives. However, in contrast, however, on the other hand, whereas, a final difference, and whereas. Now, unfortunately, the mark scheme is of limited help here because, well, I'm going to say it, the examiner is an idiot. Let's start with the positives. It starts with a summary sentence which shows the main difference between the characters. Here, the examiner has said, in source B, local guide Marius is hired and therefore paid to ensure the safety and success of the writer. She buys his experience and knowledge of the mountains to achieve her ambition. Well, that sentence, blah, 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 is not about Marius and therefore shouldn't score any marks and therefore shouldn't be in the answer. On the other hand, in Source A, Joe's companion, Simon, is involved in a partnership. Good, that was in my answer. Which suggests mutual respect, skill and collaboration are essential to ensuring their safety and survival. Well, that's about the climb itself and it's not about Simon. So again, it shouldn't be in the answer. However, although one relationship is based on an equal friendship, there is nothing in Source 8 to tell us that they are friends. The examiner knows this because they've read Touching the Void, which I've also read and I also know, but I didn't put in the answer because it's not in Source A. Both companions take responsibility for the life or death of the person they're climbing with, which shows that both relationships can be just as effective. That, again, is not in the question. Now, the reason that the examiner has done that is they're reaching for ways to show they are being perceptive. Now, what will happen in real life is that examiners are real English teachers. They will read that this is not a model answer. And what they'll do is accept anything the student writes, which is backed up by evidence from the text. The other good news is you don't have to flail about like the examiner did trying to be perceptive. You can have a detailed answer and that will get the marks. So my approach is to ask you to find as many differences as you can. Having lots of differences automatically gives you the top marks for being detailed. Detailed doesn't appear in level 3, therefore if you make lots of points you have to score between 7 and 8 marks and then it's just down to the examiner's judgement, well do I believe it's perceptive or not? And so even this particular examiner would have to give you at least 7 out of 8 marks. 
Now, if I calm down and we go back to the examiner's answer, you can see that they are signalling the differences. So we have, on the other hand, however, and then I'm expecting another difference here, but the examiner has actually gone from similarity, which shows that both relationships can be just as effective, which isn't a difference, is it? I would tear my hair out if I had any. And for those of you who always ask, well, how many words should I write or how many paragraphs? This was 219 words. I'm sure 150 words would be enough. Now, I hope you're ready to learn how to answer question five. If so, that is the video coming up now.